Mr. President. Mr. President, it's no secret that our nation faces a number of critical problems. We have a national debt that currently stands at $17.4 trillion. We are in the midst of an entitlement crisis that threatens to balloon our debt and swallow up funding for the rest of our government. And we have a still struggling economy, which was once again confirmed last week with the announcement of lackluster growth numbers. These are just some of the problems that we're facing, Mr. President. There are numerous others. And with all the challenges in front of us, you'd think that the Senate majority and the President of the United States would be focused on solving at least one or two of these problems. Sadly, that's not just the case. In this uh, heightened partisan climate, my friends in the majority are, far more often, often than not, focused on two things, shoring up their political base and marginalizing their political critics. In other words, Madam President, it's all politics all the time. It's pretty easy to find examples of the Democrats' efforts to solidify their progressive base. Indeed, we've seen in just the last few weeks, uh, we've seen it. Why else do you think we've had show votes on things like the so-called Paycheck Fairness Act and minimum wage, especially since we already have laws that say that women should be paid fairly? Why else did we have to endure an all-night speech fest on climate change a few weeks back? None of these efforts were rooted in any kind of policy justification. They certainly weren't aimed at uh, benefiting our economy or creating jobs. If anything, they would do exactly the opposite. In fact, the CBO confirmed that the Democrats' latest gambit here on the floor, the minimum wage, would actually cost our economy somewhere upwards towards a million dollars in the least a half million, uh, a million jobs, at least a, a half million jobs. No, all of these endeavors were aimed at driving turnout for the Democratic base in November. But that's just half of the Democrat equation. The other half, like I said, is silencing their critics. Indeed, over the past few years, we've seen a pattern coming from the other side, both here in the United States and in the White House, of using whatever tools are available to intimidate critics and marginalize opposition. It started, of course, with the IRS targeting scandal. I know a little bit about that, being the ranking member on the Senate Finance Committee. The IRS has admitted that in the run-up to the 2010 and 2012 elections, it was improperly, improperly targeting conservative groups applying for tax-exempt status for harassment and intimidation. Now, for obvious reasons, President Obama has tried to sweep this scandal under the rug. But the record is pretty clear on the matter. The IRS singled out conservative groups, groups that were critical of the president and his policies, for extra scrutiny. They did not treat the 501c5s, the unions, equally at all, nor did they treat 501c6s equally. These conservative groups are subjected to delays in their applications. Some still haven't got their approval after years of trying. And in several cases, they were asked a number of intrusive and, har and harassing questions about their activities and goals. There's no getting around this. That's exactly what happened. This turn of events have left a black cloud over the IRS as an agency and seriously damaged the public's trust in government. But let's be clear about this. The IRS did not engage in these activities in a vacuum. On the contrary, they were cheered on by some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who Rather than simply dealing with criticism they didn't agree with, urged the IRS to apply more scrutiny to these conservative organizations. Unfortunately, Madam President, after the political targeting scandal, the IRS wasn't finished. The pattern continued. Late last year, the agency unveiled a regulatory proposal designed to limit the quote, unquote, political activities of 501c4 organizations. If finalized, these regulations would effectively silence grassroots organizations across the country. They would no longer be able to engage in activities as innocuous as voter registration drives or candidate forums without those activities being labeled, quote, 
political, unquote. The purpose of these regulations is very clear. The administration does not want grassroots organizations educating the public on the issues of the day. They certainly don't want informing people about, they don't want them informing people about candidates' positions on matters of public policy. This regulation is designed specifically to put a stop to all of that. It's no surprise that this proposal has been condemned by groups across the political spectrum. Indeed, any objective observer would call this what it is, an affront to free speech and fair debate. But like I said, Madam President, there's a pattern here. It is an ongoing effort on the other side to undermine free speech and impose limits on Americans' participation in the political process. And it has not stopped with the IRS regulations. Just last week, it was announced that, in the, that the Senate majority plans to hold a vote on a constitutional amendment that would limit the scope of the First Amendment and allow Congress to impose limits on political speech. Just last week. It's difficult to imagine that we've come to that, Madam President, but here we are. Political speech is critical to our democracy. Indeed, this principle is at the very foundation of our republic. It is one that our Supreme Court has upheld time and again until very recently. Yet when confronted with speech they don't like, my friends on the other side of the aisle are willing to use every tool at their disposal to even change the text of the Constitution itself in order to silence it. In a marketplace of ideas like the one the founders intended, disagreeable speech can easily, easily be met with additional speech. And in the end, the truth will almost certainly prevail. But alas, my friends don't appear to be interested in the truth or marketplace of ideas. They only want one store that will sell ideas they happen to agree with. It's truly mind-boggling. But like I said, that's where we are. This isn't the end of the pattern, Madam President. In fact, the pattern of hostility towards free speech and the effort to intimidate and silence critics continues virtually every day here on the Senate floor. Almost every day, Democratic senators, including members of the Senate Democratic leadership, come to the floor to call out American citizens by name and demonize them for having the audacity to participate in the political process. They use the Senate's time and resources to single out individuals whose only crime is that they happen to have different views on public policy. I suppose their other crime is that they're, success that, that, is that <clears throat> they're successful, which is more often enough, more often than not, enough to draw the ire of my friends on the other side. But when you couple success in the economy with criticism of Democrats and their policies, it is apparently too much for my colleagues to bear. So like I said, day after day, Democratic leaders come to the floor to call out these Americans by name in order to attack them. They spread falsehoods about these Americans and their intentions. And they malign the entire conservative movement and Republic, Republican Party as guilty by association. Even if this type of demagoguery wasn't unbecoming of the United States Senate, which it is, these attacks would be shameful in their own right. After all, after all, how are these unjustified attacks on American citizens going to help our struggling economy? Are they making these attacks so they can get people off the consideration of our struggling economy? Some think they are. How are these attacks going to create jobs for the middle class? How are these attacks on American citizens going to rein in our already out of control national debt? They're not, Madam President, and they're not intended to. I could say, like I say, these days Democrats have two missions. One, solidify their base, and two, marginalize their opposition. And when they come to the floor every day, to make boogeymen out of individual Americans, they're doing both. They're not, as they claim to be, trying to, to take money out of the political equation. 
If they were, they'd be just as concerned with those on their side who spend millions bankrolling liberal causes and Democratic candidates. I'm talking, of course, about the labor unions, the trial lawyers, and billionaire environmentalists who have pledged to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in the campaign cycle alone. Instead, they're trying to scare up votes. Apparently, they believe that if they can make scapegoats out of those who choose to participate in the political process, they can cover up the fact that their policies have failed to get our economy moving and that they don't have any answers to the real problems plaguing our country. And perhaps more importantly, they think that if they can attack certain individuals for their political activities, others will be afraid to get similarly involved. Once again, Madam President, this is a pattern of hostility against both free speech and against any Americans who speak out against the policies of the Democrats. Quite frankly, it's simply shameful that it has gone this far. We need to have a different conversation. We need to talk about ideas and proposals that will actually help the American people. I hope that in the coming months, my friends on the other side will be willing to have this conversation rather than simply relying on underhanded tactics that in the view of many demean our government and the Senate in particular. That is the type of debate the American people want to see, Madam President. And I think they're smart enough to see through anything that the other side wants to offer in its place. Madam President, I've never seen it this bad in the United States Senate. I've never seen this body so ineffectual in my time, my 38 years in the United States Senate. I've never seen such politics played in this I'd have to say, awful manner. I've never seen people's free speech rights being criticized and demeaned as is going on right now. That is not to say that we haven't had some faults on our side, too. But I do have to say that it is unbelievable what's going on here. Once they broke the rules to change the rules, the Senate has not functioned as a great legislative body at all. And it won't be functioning until we get those rules back. And I believe some of our colleagues on the other side, many of whom have never been in the minority, when they finally get in the minority, and I believe that's going to happen sooner rather than later, they're going to realize that these rights were very, very important. And they're going to realize that we should be doing more in the United States Senate other than just trying to protect our side against any possible repercussions that could occur, which seems to be the major aim of our colleagues on the other side at this time, or at least the leadership of our colleagues on the other side at this time. Madam President, this is a great body. We have great people on both sides of the floor, people that I deeply admire on both sides of the floor, people who have gone that I deeply admire, who are on the other side, Never, though, have we had, at least as far as I can remember my 38 years, this type of satisfaction of, of free and fair and open debate and the right to bring your amendments to the floor that we have right now. It's a disgrace. I think they know it's a disgrace. But they don't care. They're more interested in power they, than they are in doing what's right. And the way they have singled out various conservative individuals by name on the floor is, I think, deeply troubling to anybody who's fair. Fact is, fact is, uh, the Democrats have never liked money. And if you look at Wall Street, they try to blame Wall Street for everything, but Wall Street is run primarily by Democrats. You do have an occasional Republican up there, but an awful lot of them are Democrats who are giving big dollars to the Democratic side. And they have a right to do it if they want to, without being demeaned here on the Senate floor. I just hope we'll have not only free and open debate, but we'll have better and more honest debate in the future. And that we might be able to bring our amendments to the floor on these important pieces of legislation, if they are important. Some of them aren't. We go through this almost every day so that uh, our friends on the other side can hopefully keep their majority. 
And there's always going to be some of that, but my gosh, it shouldn't be the total mission of the majority in the United States Senate. And we should be interested in freedom in the United States Senate as well as in the rest of the country. Madam President, uh, I suggest the absence of a quorum.